Hi friends, sometimes I'm able to put up my little uh, feet behind me and then you can't see what's hiding behind me. But behind me you'll see my dining room table which is covered in homework and the marble run that the kids have been building. And even behind that you'll see the kids guinea pigs, flash and nibbles and they eat lots of vegetables and they are proof that you can get fat from eating veggies. But I welcome you to the second part of our Bible study, looking at First Timothy and um, we continue. So last time we just spoke a little bit about how Paul meets Timothy and uh, how they've journeyed together quite a long way. But this week we continue with uh, verses 3. Well, this time, not this week, because we're not doing this weekly. I'm doing this kind of sporadically. We continue with uh, verses 3 to 7. So as Paul writes to Timothy, he's affirmed uh, Timothy's sort of qualification by referring to him as a child in the faith. So Paul has declared that he is an apostle, that God has chosen him, that we know that the church in Jerusalem has affirmed this, that Paul has all the credentials that one needs to be who he says he is. And so we think of Timothy and the journey that he's been on has also got the credentials and, and needs to be reminded because he is now a young disciple in charge of the church in Ephesus by, by Paul's charge. And he's going to meet lots of conflict and lots of people with different ideas. And so this blessing that often comes at the beginning of the letters or something like it, I always think is an important important note to note, is that if we opened a, a letter from God, we might expect God to say, I'm very disappointed in you for your recent behavior, and I saw what you did last summer. But instead, Paul, as he writes, inspired by the Spirit, always begins his letters with this positive kind of message, grace mercy and peace from God. Grace, meaning that kind of powerful grace and mercy that God shows to us to help us to become the people that we're called and created to be. Mercy, the ability to show kindness to others and share that kindness with others as we meet them in the world. And peace, that that joy and deep peace of knowing God's love, God's mercy, and God's strength in all that you do. Sometimes uh, leaders, and I think Timothy might be tempted in that way, lead from a place of anger and fear, and then they only lead into uh, poor directions. Whereas Timothy, if he is filled with grace, mercy, and peace, will lead in the way of peace and will be able to do a good job of pastoring the church that he is to pastor. And it's a reminder to us as pastors, to those who are appointed in positions of leadership in the church, to take hold of the, the task that you've been assigned and to do it knowing that you are legitimately appointed, legitimately elected, etc. to do the task that you're meant to do and to do it well. So Paul uh, and Timothy had been on a journey. The third myth- mission, missionary, missionary journey of Paul, uh, Paul went to Ephesus and he stayed there quite a long time, or two years. And as the church grew in Ephesus, Uh, the silversmiths became upset because they had a great trade in making idols for Artemis of the Ephesians. I imagine that with Paul preaching and teaching in Ephesus, the church growing, people becoming, putting their faith in Jesus, a lot of Gentiles from Ephesus, and even perhaps instead of foreigners coming to visit this temple of, of Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the world, they might be coming to hear what Paul has to teach in, in that region. So they, they, they sort of stage a riot, which ends up with Paul fleeing to Corinth. And, uh, but before he does that, he calls for Timothy and Silas to return to Ephesus to continue the ministry there. And so he, he's obviously me dealing with something there. And he says, uh, to, I urge you, just like I did when I was on my way, way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus. He's been there a while and now he must still remain. And the purpose of his remaining is to instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine, not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine training that is known by faith. And we know that even before Paul went to Ephesus, uh, Apollos had arrived there. Apollos was a a trained rhetor, we read, a, a a rhetorician, capable of demonstrating from the Old Testament uh, that the Messiah was Jesus himself. 
But we understand from First and Second Corinthians, where uh, Apollos went to preach even after he was at Ephesus, that there were some issues with his teaching, and those issues kind of planted seeds that might have resulted in a, a longer um, set of problems. So if we go to Acts chapter 19, in the end of 18, we read about Apollos. Uh, so just before that, before, before uh, chapter 19, at the end of 18, they came to Ephesus, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, an eloquent man, well-versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. So the way was an early reference to Christianity or the, the way of following Jesus. Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And I think that's a very important clue as to what we're meant to be doing as Christians is talking about a way of life, not about a way of believing or anything like that, but a way of walking our lives that, that follows Jesus uh, well. He spoke with burning enthusiasm, and we can just imagine this guy. He's good at talking, and, and he teaches accurately about Jesus, but we point out that he knew only the baptism of John. Uh, so we'll skip ahead to chapter 19. Uh, while Apollos was in Corinth, so then Apollos went over to Corinth, Paul came to Ephesus, and then we speak about the difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of the Holy Spirit in in verse 2 of 19, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. So John's baptism was that baptism that's preached at the beginning of the Gospels, where John talks about turning away from your sin and following Jesus more clearly. This baptism in the Holy Spirit, which doesn't involve the pouring of water, is a baptism that, that transforms the heart and transforms forms one internally. So they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And in verse 6, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether there were about 12 of them. So something happens inside these people when they receive the Holy Spirit that they burst forth in languages and in prophecy, uh, in worship, of of God. Now this glossolalia, the, the, the tongues, sometimes people understand it as a gift of the Holy Spirit that allows one to, to kind of speak in a babbling way that expresses uh, in a sort of heavenly language to God the needs of the heart. Um, and that happens sometimes uh, and it's wonderful. But also what what would have been referred to as tongues was the fact of these Gentiles praising Yahweh, the God of Israel, in their, in their home languages and speaking on behalf of Yahweh, the God of Israel, as if they were part of the family of God. So they wouldn't have been speaking in Hebrew uh, where most of the proclamation about, about Yahweh was made, but in Greek or any of their local tongues, their mother tongues that they would have spoken in and understanding in and preaching just like it was at Pentecost the sign of God saying, you belong to the family of God. So this was kind of a little, uh, perhaps, insight into the kind of teaching that Apollos was coming along with. He was great at speaking. He knew the scriptures. He could, could tell, quote this and that and, and talk about the law, etc. But he didn't seem to um, reach the heart of the gospel. And it must be clear that the heart of the gospel is not that these people spoke in tongues and prophesied, but rather that the gospel produced a kind of fruit in the lives of people. And that fruit in the lives of the people that heard it and received it was love, in verse 5, that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. So that, I mean, it's such a, a simple, almost boring little statement in verse 5 that this is the point of all the teaching. And so Paul contrasts that with the kind of spectacular and interesting teaching that perhaps someone like Apollos and, and the disciples of Apollos might have been proclaiming, which was occupied with myths and endless genealogies and kind of linking this here and that there and, and able to to prove that monkeys have tails and all of those things from a, from a long story 
whereas the the true teaching of about Jesus uh, and the instruction of true teaching about Jesus is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. And I would say that if you give us preachers half an hour every Sunday and you wait for us to say something interesting, we will come up with interesting things to say, but those things that we come up with to say do not necessarily produce love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Sometimes we as Christians prefer to hear the things that could be analogous to endless genealogies and speculations and interesting theology and verse 6 meaningless talk uh, and just sort of this, you know, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding. Um, talking about lots of talk and no true action. So part of that is probably an obsession with the details of the law and 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 it is amazing to study the law and and to to learn from the law but the other part of that is is um possibly some some strange teachings that entered so in the first century probably this um jewish um wisdom teaching that came from people like apollos that that sort of emphasized the law and that was the controversy in most of the early churches about keeping the laws or allowing people to become Christian without keeping in the laws, and then in the um, and then the Gnostic heresy, which was this kind of separation of the practical reality of Jesus from from a sort of spiritual understanding. So Christianity is a way, and that way is the way of love. And that way of love comes from a pure heart. A pure heart is often spoken of in the Old Testament and the New Testament about about the whole being of of a human being changed from from sinful intentions to good intentions and able to live a good life a good conscience which is about all of our senses purified in god and able to join our thinking and our living and sincere faith and that sincere faith is an understanding of the truth about jesus so uh, to me insincere faith is kind of believing it as if it was something that you had to believe for it to be true, whereas sincere faith is willing to ask questions about what we believe and come to the conclusion that we truly believe uh, Jesus and what he said and what he did is the truth and the resurrection, and we're able to have that sincere faith to put our trust in him and live lives that uh, contest with the world in amazing ways. And We'll learn more about that uh, from verse 8. Uh, as we talk about some of the sins that that Paul names, and uh, that's also the beginning of some interesting conversation.